Welcome to the Humans Against Poor Scholarship Summer Grant Interviews. Each one of our interviewees is competing for a $2,000 grant to help fund their summer research. Do you want to have a say in who gets funded? Become a HAPS donor today by visiting www.hapsfund.com forward slash donate. Hello, everybody. Happy Sunday and welcome to Digital Hammurabi. We are back with our second round of HAPS interviews. We have a couple of really interesting uh, PhD students to talk to today. So I'm just going to get jumped right in and introduce everyone to Dylan. Hello, Dylan. How are you? Oh, hang on. Sorry. Microphone. You... There uh, we go. Okay, we're good. I'm good. Thanks. And you? Yeah, I'm well, thank you. Um, to begin with, could you just tell everyone who you are, where you are, and what you're specializing in? Yeah, so I'm a PhD student at Africa Africa Open Institute. That's I'm associated with Stellenbosch University, which is in Cape Town, South Africa. And my research interest is in ancient Near Eastern music. More specifically, I'm focusing on the music instructional tablets, the Hurrian tablets. Um, that's my main area of focus. When I did my master's study, I focused a little bit more on the, the music theory based tablets that help inform the notation tablets. And now I'm going to focus more into the, the notation. Well, well this is, yeah. is, is really cool. Sorry, ancient music is something that I get asked about semi regularly. And I know very little about it because it's, it's a whole thing by itself that I've never actually looked at. So I'm really excited to talk to you about this. When, when you say um, musical theory tablets, what exactly are we talking about here? Yeah, so sometimes there's a little bit of an argument for they're not really a musical theoretical treatises. It's more just based on we have cuneiform tablets that describe the layout of strings of a musical instrument. With that specific tablet, we're not too sure if it's a harp or a lyre. But then we also have a tuning tablet. So it's a tablet that instructs on what kind of a retuning tablet on how to like tune a lyra, then, and then we have the physical jis um, zami, so I'm um, Akkadian for uh, a harp. And then one of the other, the one of the more important tablets is in the cuneiform Babylonian studies um, section, and that one lists. It gives us the term names. So with the notation, we have a specific term. So I'm um, quablete, for example, and then that term refers to specific strings so on that cbs 10996 tablet it gives you which strings so it gives you the term name and then it has your sa indication which is a cadence in for strings also sumerian and then it gives you the string numbers so one to five for example or four to three and it gives us these lists of strings and the interesting thing about that tablet is we're not actually too sure if it's referring to are we playing two strings at the same time or are we going to play from string one, then two, three, four, five? Or are we going to play string one and five at the same time? There is an indication for and, so that would be a U with a subscript three, which implies and, but then we also have another numbering system right next to it. So it's a little bit complicated there. And that's one of the things that I want to do with my PhD with focusing a little bit more on the notation tablets. This is now, there's a lot of issues with, well, I found issues with the way that it's being interpreted, but we can talk about that more. Yeah, absolutely. How many tablets will you be working with? Is, is this a, a big corpus or is it like maybe five? Oh, no, no. So, so there's about, well, every single time I look at the, the tablets or try and find more information on them because we have the tablets and we have fragments. So there are 32 tablets. There's the most complete one, which is the Harin H6 tablet, which everybody always is, always focuses on. But we have though the, it's 31 other tablets. Then we have smaller fragments. We have about 52 smaller fragments. So there's about 84. You know, the number keeps changing every time I look at it. And you know, I keep finding new fragments. It's a little bit annoying. <laughs> but so my PhD study is focusing on providing a complete catalog of all of the tablets and fragments. And that sounds just really useful. One. Yeah, I think it'll be, well, I hope it'll be useful to musicologists and a seriologist and not just, so my whole goal is also to make it more accessible, to make the a musical information more accessible because it just refers to string numbers. 
so that's um, with the the problems that I have with a lot of the interpretations that have been done. It's they provide it in Western notation still. So sometimes you'll have scholars that will try and avoid the Western frame, so avoiding uh, um, intervals and stuff like that. But then it's still rendered in a Western system. So still using your standard notation with your clefts or sometimes omitting that. But so then they're taking that string information, so from string one to five, and they're applying a scale, which we can kind of deduce from one of the theory tablets. But for me, that's also a little bit problematic. So what I'm trying to go for and do is avoiding the Western notation. So trying to kind of decolonize, in a sense, the West from the East or from Syria as well, and to present the information as directly as possible for each of those tablets. Then later on, the musicologists can come and play around with if they want to interpret it using any other notation style, if they want to kind of hear what it's going to sound like. But that's also one of the things I have a bit of an issue with trying to hear what these will sound like because there's not there's there's quite a few information that's still missing to be able to say this is what it sounded like. Probably that was that was going to be my next question. Is it possible to get a good sense of how this music would have sounded or is there just not enough information there? Yeah, the, this is the difficult thing. So we can kind of deduce scales and modes, but again, that's we're bringing in tritones and kind of a Western perception, adding that onto ancient information. So yeah, you can kind of deduce that, but then the problem with that is what octave register are we using? So the scale, like what's the tension of the strings? Do we can we be sure of that? That's a very difficult thing. And then also, just with the scales, there's actually 24 different possibilities of like if it aligns with how our theory, like in the Western world, like our modern music theory works, then there's too many possibilities. And that's a problem as well. Now we're applying more modern information on on ancient information, which is a difficult thing. And if we just look at the notation tablets on themselves. There's a lot of ambigu well, ambiguous information there. So again, the first thing that jumps out is we're not too sure, are we supposed to play two strings at the same time? Or are we supposed to play from string one to five in a sequence or so? And then we also have number indications after the terms. So the terms in the notation, they refer to specific strings, but then we have numbers that come in after those. And we're not too sure what those numbers could mean. Does it mean we have to repeat that that are those strings two times or three times or does that imply some sense of rhythm well, of rhythm we're not too sure of that as well so that's there's too many ambiguities with the notation itself to know what it's actually going to sound like so most of the interpretations which an interpretation just means it's kind of an approximation or like a rough just the curiosity of it and that's one of the problems that I see because now we are seeing a lot of those type of interpretations coming up. If you're just going to go and do a quick Google search for the world, all this, the world's all this melody, you'll find Dumbrell's interpretation, Kilmer's interpretation. You'll find some other ones in amongst there as well, which are going to try and realize the sound for you using artistic like expression and adding in some things to it. So adding in a rhythmical idea or like adding in theories. But that's, it's not necessarily what it, what it would have sounded like. Thank you. And going back briefly to the tablets themselves, do we know a couple of things, whereabouts they were found and what they were used for? Oh, yeah. So this is an interesting thing as well. So they were found in Abukharet. So that's in a modern day Assyria. Well, yeah, they're currently housed in the Damascus Museum. And so where they were found in Rosh Shamra. So you hear it. And that's the interesting thing because we have the uh, Mitanni Empire. We have this nice connection between Akkadian and Hurrian as well. So we have on the notation tablets, we have um, Hurrianized, no, well, we just have the Hurrian language written on top. So kind of the lyrics or the lamentations, we have the Hurrian language written on top. And then underneath, we have a Hurrianized form of Akkadian. So on the, we'll just to go a little bit back, on, on the CBS tablet, the one that gives us the terms, over there we will have um, or Kablatum, because that's your more your Akkadian normalization. And on the Hurrian tablets, we would have Kablate. So we have these slight little variations on how the terms are expressed. Uh, so that shows us also like it's a Hurrianization of uh, using a borrowed Akkadian system, because also these tablets are 
um, quite dated to different periods. So also we're using information a little bit later on or a little bit earlier on to try and decipher the notation. And the interesting thing about where the, where the tablets were found, so some of them, this, I'm going to give a seminar on this later in the year. Um, so some of the tablets were found close to the royal palace courtyard. And so those are some of the bigger tablets. You know, they were found there. Some of the smaller fragments also, but they were found kind of on top of the stairwell. So they kind of fell down. So they're not too sure exactly where it would have been. Would it, would it have been in a library or like where were these tablets housed? But some of the smaller fragments, they were found in a sealer. So kind of like a catacomb or well, not a catacomb, more like a, a, like a tomb, but not for people in a sense, because there was liver models found there and um, lung models. So used for divination. So we have these tablets also found in kind of in the context of a divination as well because also if we refer to some of the lyrics so some of that can be translated because Harin is a difficult language to translate um, it's only starting to gain traction a little bit now but a lot of the well if we just take the Harin H6 because that tablet has gotten a lot of focus that's a praise to the goddess Nikal, which is for like the praise or it's kind of like a praying like asking for um, to help with fertility or for child well, yeah, uh, uh, to bear children so it's kind of like it has this ritualistic kind of like a sound worship offering that it has behind it that's what it seems like but then you also have the other ones that were found at the royal palace so it seems like were those ones busy like being used and played were musicians playing from them it's just a lot of questions that are very difficult to answer that's really interesting thank you for sharing it i um i always enjoy hearing about the context of objects and what they were found with because that adds such a nuance and it's something that I feel um, academics are not always great at, at including yeah. you have these beautiful texts and you translate them and you give your analysis of the text but then you don't always include where is this thing found and what was it found with and how does that yeah. influence what um, what you think it was it was being used for. We have a couple of questions from the audience. Uh, first and probably easiest is what kinds of dates are we looking at for these tablets? Oh, so we have the Aryan H, well, well the Aryan tablets, 1400 BCE. We have the, I have a timeline also somewhere of this, but I remember we quite, we have quite a few other theoretical tablets as well, but mainly we have some from 800 BCE, and then we have a little bit earlier ones as well. Um, so Neo Neo Babylonian period, we have. Uh, they're quite difficult to now. Like I'm just gonna be, let me try to find my little timetable, my little timeline. While we take the questions, maybe. Yeah, absolutely. Um. So the, the other question was someone saying that they read that the fourth string of the harp in Sumerian was connected with the god Enki. Is there some evidence of connection between the gods and musical instruments or music itself? Yeah, that, that, that's an interesting tablet. That's one of the well, ones that I term the music theory tablet. So that's the UET uh, 770, no, 726 tablet, where we have the fourth string that's um, to the god E. So it's Abanu, uh, e Abanu, so um, created by the god here or E. And then that's the only kind of reference we have. No, actually, we have the tablet from the Yale Babylonian collection as well, which has then that refers to your nine strings. Um, so, so it's numbered from one, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, five, um, all the way down to nine. The other tablet just goes one, two, three, four, five, four, three, two, one. And, th and then with that one, we have the fourth string that refers to the god ear. And on the other ones, we also have references to some of the other gods kind of also placed into there, which is a little bit interesting as well. That's fascinating. And I know that, um, well, actually, this is a slightly different question. Um, do we have any tablets that don't relate to stringed instruments? Um, my husband worked a lot on um, liturgies that were most likely used with uh, to reskin drums. But I, I don't know if, if you have any kind of musical notation for percussion instruments. Uh, not that we're aware of just yet, but we have a lot of um, iconography, like uh, referring to a lot of different instruments as well. 
and yeah, we have um, the references to drums and you know, percussive instruments, and yeah, you know, um, you know, there's a lot of other textual sources, but they don't really give a kind of notation for it. And that's the interesting with the well, the interesting thing with the instruction on the uh, notation. So the way that I want to try and interpret these in a more accessible format also is because it because if it just refers to strings, so I have, I use a plus minus sign to refer to it can either be string one or to string five. But the thing is, it kind of works like a tablature where it can, like, I, there doesn't have to necessarily be a string. It can also be like the pitches. So if, like if you can imagine singing like from your first string to your fifth string, if you, were to, if you were to play your first note on the piano and your fifth note on the piano, like if you were to kind of sing that. So you can also use those numbers for other instruments other pitched instruments for percussion we're not really too sure or anything like that well that nothing has come up yet that's really interesting and i have to ask how did you get into ancient music oh so i studied music so i first started with my a music degree in music education and focusing on classical guitar or oh, i prefer my metal guitar you can see my some my guitars in the background and so i was always interested um in metal music and playing guitar. So there's my string instrument reference that does play some percussion. And then um, as an elective, because I've also always had an interest in the ancient, well, when anything ancient. So like with ancient Egyptians, like I've always had a fascination with in, you know, anything ancient, it's quite funny. Um, but I enrolled in um, ancient culture studies when I was doing my music studies as well. And then just because I was curious, like, oh, is there any music or anything like that? Then I started latching on to all of the different types of notations, just because at that time I was also learning to read notation and like one well, the classical guitar as well. And then I was just like interested and then it just popped up and became an obsession and a passion just to try find out more. Because in the beginning, I just wanted to know what do these clay tablets show? Like, how does it work? And it took us a big whole loophole trying to figure out how it works. Yeah, so that's that's my main that was my main goal. <laughs> that's wonderful. Thank you. Um, another audience question: uh, the gentleman who asked about um, the dating. Um, yeah, is what you're talking about the earliest example of notated music? And do we have any other earlier examples of music from that region, or earlier yes, mentions of music that aren't? No uh, this is the earliest example that we currently have that we know of. Yeah. That's excellent. And um, do you know, and I know, I know this might be a little bit outside of what you've been looking at, do you know what some of the earliest references in other texts to music are, or is music not really um, something that turns up a lot in, in cuneiform literature? Um, there's a lot of references to kings playing instruments and being very proficient in playing and there's a lot of references to musicians so nam nar and um like a kalu or cult a priest musicians and there's a lot of references to music that we can get a general picture you know like with with ancient Near eastern music as well so it's a very complicated thing because it's the way we think about music we think oh it's for entertainment and you know they would also have but they would have different classifications for their music as well. It would be a thing of, so for instance, in the modern period, if you're listening to, because I grew up in the Middle East also, um, listening to the mosques, you wouldn't really call that music, but they are singing, but it's worship. So there's this whole thing of how do we classify music? It's, yeah, so it's, we have to be careful with, because now we have the Haryan tablets as well, where they're used as a form of a worship or a sound worship or a sound offering. Do we call it music in that sense? Is it supposed to be a virtuosic piece? Is it supposed to be something for entertainment, for enjoyment? What was the purpose? And that's you know, that's where we have to look a little bit more into the context. I feel like that kind of goes back to what you were saying about using Western musical notation systems to try and understand something that is completely different and unrelated to, yeah. to what we know. So using, yeah. like looking at, at what's going on from the inside of that culture rather than taking our own understanding of music and kind of placing it down um, on top of, of something else. Um, so I have one last question uh, before we let you go. What are your summer plans and how can HAPS funding help you achieve those? 
Oh, so I, the, before I just answer that one, I want to say something about the notation as Please, well. Yeah. Quickly, um, there's this other dangerous trap that we can fall into because now if you're going to avoid Western notation and we're going to try and look at the Oriental side a little bit more, right? The difficult thing there is because we have these ancient texts that are so far scattered. And do we want to play the game of saying the Middle Eastern musical tradition didn't change much? Because we can look at Makwam's as well. Um, so that's what Adambro does in his research, which is it's a, it's a good idea. It works very well. Um, but there's the problem of are we going to say that the music stayed stagnant? Or, because how would it have evolved? Would it have evolved? Would it not have evolved? We have all these sources all over the place. We're not too sure. So that's one of the complicated things that we must just be careful of. And that's why I'm going for a more direct approach. So using a tablature where it's just telling us the strings and not trying to assign any pitches to it. That can be someone else's jobs. The other musicologists can go and fight and argue about that. And I just want to give the information as a full, complete catalog. It's, it's so a very my, worthwhile thing to do. Yeah. So my plans for the summer is I'm doing a lot of seminars. So I have two coming up, which I'm going to try and talk about two of my chapters that I already have working and going on so the one as i spoke about was about the context of where the tablets were found and the other one is the problems with this um performance scholarship that's what i call it because a lot of the interpretations how you're going to try and play it and refer it to like untraditional arabic music and say oh it sounds similar and that's also a dangerous type of thing but my plans is one thing that i want to try to do that might it's going to be difficult but that's not the main reason that i'm using the funding for is i want to try go to syria to the Damascus Museum to get photographs of these tablets because there are some photographs of the tablet. I have photographs from, from 1968 of some of the fragments, but that's not the complete collection. And because a cuneiform is a 3D written, um, like it's physically inscribed into clay, you want to actually be able to, well, firstly, go and see the tablets yourself. That'll be nice. But to also go and compare it with photographs to see if we haven't missed any Thing, and just to have the photographs. Um, but my other thing for funding would be to assist with getting courses in um, hurry and grammar, because that'll be for the uh, looking at the, the lyrical section or the lamentations above the notation. So I can get a little bit more deeper into that because I'm, I'm, I currently am still taking um, the Cadian lessons. And I also want to just also as an extra take up more Assyriology courses. And then that's what I would use the funding for. So for Assyriology courses and in hurry and grammar. So I can just make sure I have a fully rounded um, catalog. <laughs> well, thank you so much for coming and telling us about your research. It sounds absolutely fascinating. Um, I don't have any more questions. Is there anything else that you wanted to share before I let you go? Um, no. I don't think so. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you again, Dylan. It was lovely chatting with you, and I'll be in touch at the end of the month. Okay, cool. Thank you. Uh, thank, thank you for you. having me. Of course. Bye. Okay, that is Dylan. He is an Assyriologist working in South Africa on uh, Hurrian music tablets, which, again, is... I say this every time. Everything is always so fascinating. I love hearing about all of the new research, so... Uh, ancient musicology, not something I know anything about, but that was a delightful conversation. And we actually have our next interviewee ready and waiting to go. So we are just going to roll right along. Hello, Andrea, how are you? Fine, I'm doing well. How about you? Yes, very well, thank you. Very well. Could you um, introduce yourself, who you are, where you are, and what your speciality is? Gladly. I am a PhD student at La Sapienza University of Rome in Assyriology, of course, as you said, and uh, I um, deal also with mainly with Akkadian and Sumerian texts. But to give you a better, a better idea of what I do, I have, present, I re I have prepared a short uh, presentation, really short, like three slides. So don't expect anything, but OK, yeah, I that think sounds that's great. Important. Because in my opinion, it's quite easy to imagine uh, archaeology on the field, but I don't think this is so easy for an Assyriologist. So I I would like to show you some photos and the thing that I doing. Mm -hmm. So I will try to share my screen. Just a moment. Ba ba ba. 
I can you see it? Yes. Okay, perfect. So uh, in these photos, you can see my tutor, Professor uh, Lorenzo Verderame and I at uh, the Yale Babylonian Collection in uh, Yale University this November. So it was the first time I was able to touch uh, a cuneiform table with my own hands. So was quite, it's quite useless to uh, say how much I was thrilled and overjoyed because I think, you know, you can imagine it. <laughs> but uh, we were there for a project that I'm doing in parallel with my PhD about a long document uh, dating back to 3rd millennium BC and that come from the ancient city of Nippur. So if you are interested in this kind of document, you can find, uh, uh, I think, pretty nice uh, uh, interview made uh, by Pavla Rosenstein, that is the uh, girl who uh, managed the um, Instagram page of Yale Babylonian Collection, or in my website that you find the link here. But uh, uh, so this project was aimed to my real uh, research interest. So the reconstruction of social economics dynamics of the period. So third millennium BCE. BC. So uh, most of my research uh, focus on the study of Sumerian um, cuneiform text. Also, my first approach, I think that uh, like every astrologist, start uh, with the royal inscription uh, or with the letter, literary text. I quick turned my interest into administrative text from one of the best document, uh, the documented uh, period of human history, the one of the third dynasty of Ur. So we are in uh, 21st century BC, quite a long, uh, quite, uh, a long time ago. Uh, so, um, my PhD project uh, concerned the reconstru reconstruction of social dynamics, mainly through the analysis of Ditilla Corpus. So, uh, texts that we can consider is as court records. They are extremely interesting, uh, in my opinion, for several uh, things. But for most, uh, uh, they allow us to answer a question that I have often wondered about uh, what we have in common with them and how different were the people far away in time and space from us. So I will try to show you my point of view in the next few minutes. Obviously, Megan, when you want, just stop me because I can talk for hours about the Ditilas and that kind of stuff. This so. is great. You go for it. So, uh, what, why we uh, should interested about we should be interested about Ditilas? But uh, well, we can uh, start for this one. Uh, the text that you can see in the slide is about uh, uh, this inheritance uh, of a man because of theft he had committed. So we can uh, read the text together. Alu, son of Lugalka, stole the oxen of Akala, son of Humu Urumu, I love the ancient name. Because he stole the oxen, Lugalka disinherited Alu. Before Urmami, before name broken, it was decided. Urmanish Tushu, his Alu, his, um, it means Alu's son, brought a legal case before the governor, but was still disinherited. For among them, it was Urmami who will take the corresponding goat, Ludingira, son of Lug Lugalbatae, Dadamu, and Urningar, son of Habaluge. They were the bystanders, so like witnesses, we can say. Mont Extra, Yer, and Magalanna, the end priestess of Nanna, was installed. The second one, in my opinion, is a little bit spicy. So it concerned the reputation of a wife because he had a pre-marital affair with a man that obviously was not her husband. Urlama, son of Lubaba, had married Kata, daughter of the gardener Lugal Igiush. Since a stranger has slept with her without Urlama knowing, he re retracted the oath and Kata herself confirmed with her or moat. For this reason, Kata was repudiated. Gudea was the commissioner. So, Although this may see may, mm, 
may seem, yeah, like dif distant situation uh, from our society, I think these cases uh, are quite illustrative how even uh, at that time the family and the social relationship were subordinated to uh, the social norms. Uh, I will interrupt the... Uh, this way, in this way we can see each other, <laughs> and were subordinated to the social norms. Uh, what is great about this text uh, is that they allow us to uh, see how, despite the fact uh, that uh, more than 4,000 years have passed, some dynamics are similar to those today. I mean, for example, in these two cases, no matter how much you were loved, whether you are son or you are wife, if you go against the dictates of society, you risk losing everything you have. So the Ditilas text allow us to see what uh, uh, has always made human beings uh, human. So I mean the social relationship. I could summarize this uh, uh, by simply saying that my research interest is in the study of ancient societies through textual documentation. My focus, however, is not uh, on the history of kings or elite. My interest, uh, interest uh, is reconstructing and understanding uh, the daily life of what we may call the ordinary Mesopotamian person. <laughs> so all my research are focused uh, on reconstructing the history that took place in the shadow of temples and palaces, actually in the home of the people of the time, uh, we can say. So uh, perhaps uh, some of you are wondering why I consider Assyriology so important, but the answer is quite simple in my opinion. In addition to provide insight into a very ancient part of human history, because currently uh, so this documentation is part of the oldest uh, uh, documentation, sorry for re the repetition, uh, that have given us a written record. This study, I hope, will allow me in the future to bring many people closer to the past, showing how much we have in common with the, these human beings, so the human beings of the past times. I think that uh, coming in end, the modern society will be um, in, in different ways. But for example, because if someone can empathize with uh, someone who lived 4,000 years ago, he or she will be able to do with the same the same with his neighbor, his or her neighbor. So let's say that I see Assyriology as a field of inquiry, both academically, but also socially. If in academy it allows me to do extremely specialized and perhaps maybe sometimes boring uh, studies like, I don't know, the grammatical structure of Sumerian, at social level, I think that is good training for tolerance and understand, understanding that underneath we are all alike. We are always human and we have been always in this way, obviously with some difference made by the culture. But moreover, you know, studying society and specifically, in specifically the family in contexts that are different from Howard's, allow us to understand how much culture influences our lives. And in the end, there is a really a little part of natural being in being human. So we can think about how we act and how we live depends on the culture we are raised in. So this is briefly my research interest and uh, what I do in my life for now. <laughs> so. That was fantastic. Thank you so much. Uh, we have a very quick question about one of the tablets that you showed us, the second yeah. one. Um, someone is asking what repudiated means in this context. Do we know what would have happened to Carter? Uh, actually, yeah, we can uh, uh, assume it. I mean, uh, for sure, the woman will go back uh, in the house uh, of her father or in the uh, some house of the brother because we know that for example the uh, condition of the woman at the time was pretty different from uh, our uh, in nowadays but uh, uh, there are some people some women actually that uh, have more uh, uh, freedom we can say 
also on the economic basis. Some mm, woman has, uh, I don't know, like uh, their own uh, uh, hereditary or their own activities. We know, for example, that some women um, lend money. That we can, the, the, the thing that we can call money. Also, if the, there is no money in Mesopotamia, uh, so remember it because it's quite important. Otherwise, we will be a little confused. But yeah, this, that's all. So we can assume, and we are pretty sure about it, that the woman go um, in the previous situation. So under the, um, in Latin is patria potestas, of the men who uh, watched there before. So that's Thank it. you. And we, we have an, another question about that example. Um, someone is asking, is it, is, did, was the woman divorced because she had a sexual relationship before the marriage or is it specifically because her husband was unaware of what had happened? I, I love this question because uh, I actually I bring it uh, as the main uh, um, object of investigation last year in the Azor uh, in, um, that take place in Boston. And I had, uh, I'm writing an article uh, that his title is uh, The Importance of Being Reckless. I mean, in my opinion, the, the woman was repudiated not be, because uh, uh, the just the sexual uh, act, but I think that was more important the social stigma that she had. And also the laws of fate, we can say in this way, the husband had. So, you know, if some, someone betray you, maybe you are not so happy in one hand. On the other hand, uh, for sure, the, from the social point of view, she was not a good wife. So I think that is both. But I don't think that was more for the sexual act, but I think that on, the, on one hand though, could be for the um, husband that feel betrayed or on the other hand, could be for the social stigma that uh, the sexual relationship before the marriage could implicate. I see. Thank you very much. Um, and we have another question. Is there much data on what life was like for ordinary children in Mesopotamia? I'm working on it, but, uh, you know, uh, we know we have to think uh, in, in a precisely way. When we have Aditila, or when we have a text in general, in the case of Mesopotamian civilization, something doesn't work. I mean, the text was the exception, not the ordinary situation. So we don't have like, you know, the book of childhood in uh, in the- There are no parenting guides yeah, or- Exactly, unfortunately, because it uh, could be like amazing to say it. But uh, we know, for example, that some children were self as slave. So we know the, um, the situation at the border of society. So when something broke in this social dynamics, and I'm working on it, so stay connected in the next month after I submit my dissertation, <laughs> and uh, I can uh, maybe tell you more. But no, we don't have uh, any precisely information about child children because actually they are pretty in, in, invisible in the documentation because they were not uh, able to legal uh, legally act so this is the main problem thank you and the the corpus of texts you're working with are they primarily legal documents yeah they uh, mainly add uh, our legal document very specific uh, uh, typology that um, we can uh, individuate by uh, the continent of the text, but also from the structure. And uh, uh, for example, uh, some of them has a um, tag at the beginning or at the end that uh, is di tilla, that means closed case. D is the legal case, Tilla is the nominalization of the verb to till, to conclude. So when you see, obviously, like we had in the half of documentation, this tag, because otherwise it will be so much easier to, to catch the, this kind of text. 
but uh, in for example i'm working on uh, the uh, the um, the all the the corpus that uh, uh, can count about uh, 420 more or less i don't remember if it's 23 or 25 uh, texts that uh, we can consider as titillas and before i starting my phd uh, were known uh, roughly 4000 texts but now I'm working on some unpublished that unpublished text kept, for example, in the Yale Babylonian collection. And so it's quite complicated, but yeah, yeah, they are definitely legal. Are they all from the same location or are they from a, a couple of different houses in a city? Yeah, uh, completely. Or do we not know? <laughs> Most uh, mostly we don't know because I don't know. I, I'm pretty sure that uh, the everybody's know, but uh, most of the the majority of the cuneiform texts come from uh, uh, illegally digging, so we don't have the context. And uh, when we have context, uh, they come from ancient excavation. And when I say ancient, I mean like in the 80th century excavation at the end of 80 uh, of the 90th century. Sorry. So at the time, they don't care very much about uh, where the text was, but they were they were much aware about. Oh my gosh, I found the text! So they didn't record it, unfortunately. But uh, uh, we have mainly the documentation that comes from the province of Umma and Girsu. So, uh, for example, we can assume that they were kept uh, in the uh, official archives. Because, for example, in the city of Nippur, which, which is uh, one of the main cities that uh, uh, give us uh, the, we can say, provide text. For example, the law one that I mentioned uh, before, as um, very few um, texts that can be uh, considered as titilla. This is probably because uh, we don't uh, have found yet the official archive. So in my opinion, and in the scholar's opinion that studied this kind of test before me, um, they were kept in the official uh, archive, but uh, not only. We cannot, uh, for example, we have some texts that uh, have made by copy. So we have uh, two copies of the main of the same text. So we can assume that uh, they were kept also from uh, uh, by the, um, the 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 people who um, had the, the legal case, who, who were who were the subject of the legal case. So. Who knows? But we can just make uh, uh, we can make a lot of uh, hypotheses and thank you. And oh, what I are think. your what are your summer plans and how would HAPS funding help you? So in several ways, actually, because uh, actually uh, right now I'm not uh, in Rome. I'm in Tübingen in Germany because here they have a, an amazing, a magnificent library that allows me to uh, work uh, in the perfect place, I, can, I would say. So uh, for sure, mm, the fund will help me with this kind of uh, uh, cost. But the main, uh, the main aim of the fund will be another. So uh, before I answer this question, I would like to say that uh, everything I do is uh, in function of my bigger project. So on the one hand, uh, the increase of knowledge in the academic field regarding the socioeconomic situation of the third dynasty of war, but also in function of the, we can say, democratization of Assyriology. And so how to do this? Perhaps uh, the first part, so the academic point, is the, is the easiest part. Uh, is accomplished by studying a lot of uh, a lot and with passion. In fact, it's for that that I'm actually in Tübingen, and because here I have the opportunity to meet uh, uh, many scholars uh, of Assyriology field, and uh, uh, during this period I will also uh, pursue a project regarding the social network behind the mercantile activities in the ancient city of Nippur. The trickiest part uh, comes with the second half of my long-term project, so democratizing uh, uh, Assyriology. I believe uh, it has been a subject for just specialists for too long. 
So then again, anyone would hesitate to approach uh, a documentation win with hundreds of thousands of text uh, in cuneiform script written in at least four different languages. So in July, I will be attending a summer school regarding the digital humanities at Oxford University. And this will be my first step toward the domesticating a seriology for non-specialists. So this fund will be used primarily for this. The course will be about natural language processing in Python, from text processing to meaning, to meaning extraction, as well as the basic of automated semantic analysis with machine learning. So being a programming course, <clears throat> I would need probably a better computer than the one I am using now. And also the fund will allow me to cover some of the costs of my stay in Oxford. Last but not least, I have applied for another summer school regarding the digital humanities at the University of Helsinki, but I'm still waiting for their response. And the funds will also help me to attend this other summer school. So the app scholarship, we can say um, that will help me in uh, many of the expenses uh, I have to incur this summer supporting me both in the writing of my PhD thesis, because uh, I'm uh, at the last year and I have to submit my dissertation on January 24. So tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> and the ultimate, uh, uh, and mainly because uh, this is the real reason why I'm asking for this fund is uh, in the training of digital humanities. The ultimate goal is to release uh, what we can call a dream. So make uh, a seriology at everyone's finger teams, uh, which actually is my motto. So before I conclude, I would like to thank you for having me and I hope you do, don't bother you with boring things or something like that. Uh, this has I been fascinating and <laughs> just very interesting. And it's, it's wonderful always for me to talk to people who are so passionate about the ancient world and specifically a seriology because I'm an seriologist and it it's a wonderful <laughs> field um and so so I, just in case the people listening didn't didn't catch it what you're talking about doing at Oxford is is learning uh computer programming so yeah. that you can take these thousands of texts and not have to sit and read every single one yourself but run them through a series of programs to get the relevant information out which is much more cost effective and time effective and then will allow you to share this information much more broadly than you'd be able to do if, if it was just you um working through them the old-fashioned way and uh, yeah is this the, the point uh, in the old-fashioned way we can make some analysis uh, and uh, I think that uh, we incur in the same big problem. So just a seriologist uh, read the a seriologist test. In this other way, with machine learning and different programming, people that come from different fields and also, I don't know, my grandma or your grandma can uh, just read, just being curious about uh, i don't know the marriage or the divorce or the disinheritance or whatever can read the text directly and can make the some consideration so this is the point the old fashion it works because we know that it works but i think that we can make it better and with programming and uh, this the digital humanities will be easier for everyone because uh, my main uh, uh, interest uh, is not to publish unpublished text that uh, is like, you know, a rush. Find a text, publish it, then boom. No, uh, I think that Assyriology doesn't lie in this, but I think that lies more in the really uh, complex studying that try to depict the society, try to understand the human being of that period. And with the with the machine learning with it, with this kind of pro program will be definitely easier to publish and uh, to uh, communicate to the person the content of the text so i hope to, to to do this course and to be able to do it in the in my future well there's a 
admirable goals certainly <laughs> and i wish you the very best and thank, thank you. you so much for coming on and sharing your research and your passion with us this was a delight my pleasure before i go i would like to thank you for uh and also the other organizer for this fantastic initiative but uh, i would like to thank the donors too because uh, i don't care how the scholarship will go but uh, it warm it warmed my heart to know that uh, there are people who care about our research and support us uh, in different ways so i think that this is amazing and uh, thank you just to do it well you're welcome and i want to echo your thanks our donors are fantastic people who are just everyday people who are interested in the ancient world like you and me yeah, and who exactly. are willing and able to put a couple of dollars in every month every year to help us fund It's students amazing. like you so we are we going to finish there andrea thank you so much for coming on i'll be in touch at the end of the month to let you know what happens yep. next have a nice one you too bye Ciao. that was andrea working on all three uh, legal texts and again fascinating i love this job I am, I am the world's luckiest person. Um, if you are watching and you are unfamiliar with HAPS, it is a nonprofit that we run here. Um, our primary focus is providing summer research grants for PhD students, $2,000 per student to do really whatever they want with. Um, it can mean, like Andrea said, funding her while she stays in Tübingen or paying for training that people need or travel to conferences or um, excavations or just paying rent while you sit at home and write so that you don't have to go and get a job and prolong the whole PhD experience. Uh, if you are interested in hearing more, we have several playlists on the channel of previous um, grant interviews. The website has also been running across the bottom of the screen for the last hour. It's www.hapsfund.com. You can donate there. You can read about who we are and what we do and find out information about previous uh, scholarship recipients. Thank you all so much for joining me. It has been a pleasure to share the past hour with you all. Thank you to those who had questions thank you to those who were just interested to listen we will be back next saturday and sunday at 12 noon edt on both days and next weekend is the hebrew bible applicants so we're going to hear a lot about hebrew and archaeology and all of the interesting things that go along with that so please do join us then and have a lovely week <laughs>